Welcome to America Open for Business, where we talk with high growth entrepreneurs and leaders who have found success in one of the world's most important markets. Hi, I'm Cameron Heffernan, and this is the America Open for Business podcast, where I talk with high growth entrepreneurs and leaders who have found success in one of the world's most important markets. This episode of our show is in the Founders and Owners series, and it's brought to you by Your B2B Marketing, a truly global marketing agency. Uh, many mid-market B2B companies, they face challenges in clearly defining their value proposition and articulating it to customers. We help founders and leaders understand what makes their products and services invaluable to customers and help them put that front and center. That enables our clients to focus on company growth and new market entry, not marketing initiatives, and realize the best and highest use of their time. Discover how we can drive your expansion by visiting www.yourb2bmarketing.co, and that's not .com, but .co. Uh, past guests on the show include Brian Smith, the founder of the Ugg brand, the famous uh, sheepskin boots from Australia, and author of Birth of a Brand about his personal journey to the creation of what became a billion dollar consumer footwear brand. And today I'm happy to have on the show, Bill Troy of Polaris Institute. And uh, Bill is a 20 plus year member of EO Columbus, as well as co-founder with another EO member from, from DC, uh, Anna Birch, uh, who is also a global EO and YPO facilitator. Polaris Institute, works with high potential enterprise leaders and teams to open up new opportunities and breakthroughs through the proprietary Polaris process, which is trademarked, and we'll get into that in a moment. In addition to uh, Bill and Anna's ongoing work with enterprise clients, uh, they often speak globally about brain science-based innovation and recently conducted a workshop as part of the 2023 EO EMP Entrepreneurial Master's Program at Harvard. Welcome to the show. Bill Troy. Thanks. It's great to be here. All right. What is the Polaris process? Right. Well, um, I would say that in general, it's about turning high performing and high potential individuals into teams. We all have groups of people that we work with or that we're a part of or that we want to want to have perform. And there isn't a, a lot to help people become a team. What is a team? What is what does a team look like? How does a team function? We have shared objectives, shared goals, but what is the process of becoming a team? And we use a brain science-based model because what that does is sort of uh, depersonalize it, right? We all have differences. We have biases. We have histories. We have goals. We have objectives as individuals. And we're especially high potential and high-performing people are rewarded for driving through that, right? And driving their goals and their objectives. But then we conflict as a team and we're running over each other and we're not getting along and so how do we come together as a team and work together what does that look like so that's really what we're working on teams for team okay. on teams and yeah conflict is bad it slows teams down it's a it's a negative thing it it is for a lot of teams but when we work with people it isn't um what we do is we teach them a conflict we look at conflict in some ways like a football play right yeah. as it starts to unfold and you see that conflict exists you say oh we're ready for this. We practice this. Conflict means that two people or multiple people have a different view of things, right? Different opinion of things. And that can either be a conflict we have to resolve or somebody wins and loses, or we just let it go. Or it can be an opportunity to say, we've got multiple perspectives here. We can capitalize on this. This is a chance for innovation, a chance for creativity. We can embrace it and go, oh, this is great. So when we work with a team, they love when they find conflict because it isn't damage its mm -hmm. opportunity. Wow. What would an engagement look like with it with a client or these workshops, strategic planning? How does it how does it uh, play out? Yeah, we have sort of a, you know, good, better, best uh, tiered approach. Um, the simplest thing is an awareness program, which can be just a workshop. We've done that um, for, you know, um, large companies, for example, going into the strategic planning process. Let's do an awareness workshop to make you guys see some new things before you go in and work together on your strategy. Um, it can range all the way to most of the clients we work for are ongoing coaching, right? So we're sort of the coach that comes in and says, what are you guys dealing with? Let's wrestle with this. Let's get it together because teams constantly evolve. So that's more of a culture building, ongoing coaching and training. Sometimes it's with the team and sometimes it's even with individuals on the team. 
So yeah. do you think of yourselves as, as leadership training for teams? Yes, uh, in a way. I think we are capacity building for teams. Mm -hmm. um, I think we show them what opportunities and capacity there is in the room that they're not recognizing and how to okay. capitalize on that. In a way, we're lowering the friction of being a team mm -hmm. and making it being a team a more positive thing. You know, I, I shared an example with you earlier. We were talking about all-star teams. Um, yeah. I frequently come in to work with an executive team where everyone in the room, we did this with a with a company in the space industry building um, some space equipment for NASA. Yeah. And man, everyone in that room was an alpha. They were the top of their, you know, whether, whether it was, you know, rocket design or, you know, entry mechanics or whatever. Hmm. And they had all been rewarded for being really good and really successful. But you come together as a team and they were all there to drive their own vision for what should happen. It was just yeah. fight, 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 fight. And we were able to show them, look, you guys are an all-star team, but you're, you're not acting as a team. You're all coming hit this with a history of being the smartest person in the room and having all the answers. But now you're in here with equals. Now what are you going to do? Mm. And so really take them through a day of figuring out what does a team do? How does a team function? How do you go from being bickering individuals to being a team of superheroes where I know that, you, you know, losing, using the Marvel version of that, you've got invisibility, I've got super strength. When do we call on each of us? And we love the fact that we have people with different skills on the team. And that's a great thing. And that changes the dynamic of that team. Wow. Is there any uh, a, a example of an exercise you can talk us through for our listeners for what that might look like? Yes. Well, we start by using the brain science of, of how your brain works and why, why your brain functions the way it does. And okay. there, there's a longer version of that, but we end up getting you to the point where to, so everyone can see that everyone has a bias and the bias that you bring to your reality, whether that's we've got to push or we've got to take our time or we've got to, mm. is based on your history. Your brain only knows what it's ever seen and experienced in its life. Yeah. And so you bring that into every room you go into and it looks to you like the way things have to be done. Mm. You know, we've got to speak up. We've got to be quiet, whatever that is. Right. Yeah. And other people that do it differently than you are wrong. I mean, we can think in our society about how we all yell at each other all the time where people have a different perspective than us, whatever side you're on of any issue, you know, right. the other side is always a complete idiot, right? Yeah. Because how can you not see? It's so obvious. Well, it's obvious to all of us because it's our own reality and our own experience. And when we can show that each of us have that, and it's normal to have that, it's not a bad thing. It just is the way brains work. We can realize that, okay, this isn't a personal thing. This is just six brains around a table that all have different perspectives. And we can come together and discuss that and acknowledge it and go, what do you see? What do you see? Now it's something we can work on together instead of saying, I've got to you know, beat you or fix you or whatever. Right. So you're kind yeah. of challenging to me. I think when I think I hear the word bias, yeah, I think there that's a negative connotation, right? But you're yeah. challenging that, right? It's become a negative word in our society um, because what we're talking about is when one person's bias injures another person, um, but in fact, we're all biased. I mean, our brains, again, like I said, have had limited experience on this planet in the course of our lives. And our brain can't know anything else than that. And our brain's job is to kind of anticipate and create what we want to see and try to, you know, make life what we want it to be. And so being able to sort of stop and address that and say, no one is good or bad. You just are who you are. Now let's talk about what we want to accomplish as a group and say, how do we get that done? And who around the table has a new perspective? Who has, who has some bias that's good that could help us? Who can see something that I can't see? And we make that a, some, make something that's a superpower for the team and not something that tears the team apart. Is it, do you find it challenging to no, negotiate or, or I guess navigate is probably the better word within corporate hierarchies? Often I guess you're going to engage with somebody at the C level or maybe an HR that brings you in. Is that a challenge when you're trying to work in a, a team kind of structure? Um, it, it can be what, what the, the challenge we run into is when someone wants to bring us in to fix other people, right? <laughs> <laughs> fix my team or fix my boss or whatever that. Yeah. you, you kind of can't convince someone to do it if they don't want to do it. So it really has to make sure you have to make sure you have buy-in from everyone that's going to be involved in the process. Um, otherwise when we get in the room with people and we can kind of break this down and we have some techniques we use to literally show people you're making up this reality. You're completely not seeing what's really right and what's really true. And in fact, no one is. All of a sudden it resets everyone to go, oh, wow. Okay. 
and it really sort of no matter what level you're at. So it's a matter of whether people want to go there or not. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And is this when you engage with companies, I assume it's mostly companies that you're working with. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is it uh, sort of like the way I think of strategic planning? Maybe that's not the right, maybe it's more the traditional way is strategic planning happens a little before the end of the year. We do it once and then we don't do it again until next year. Are you doing it a little bit different than that? Yes. We're not doing strategic planning. We are helping the strategic plan actually work. Hmm. So, um, for example, as I mentioned before, we worked with that with that um, high performing um, you know space industry company. Help them make sure they got a good strategic plan, right? Okay. Help we can really explore some things. Um, typically, what we're doing is more ongoing work, and we have a client, for example, right now where one company acquired another company, mm. and there's really a lot of tension in this company because who's in charge of where we go? right? Mm -hmm. Company A is one kind of company. Company B is a different kind of company. They kind of complement each other, but they're not the same approach. Uh, one of them is more analytical. One of them is more creative. And so the analytical company bought the creative company and the analytical company is saying, well, we bought you. So we're in charge, right? The creative company is saying, yeah, but you thought we were so cool. You wanted to buy us. So <laughs> <laughs> we know what's right because you wanted us. And they just, they're just fighting all the time about who decides how things work and what's right and what's wrong. And the idea that it has to be one or the other is, is something we're trying to break through with them and say, let's just say it's neither and it's going to be a new third thing. And what is that? What can we create and let go of that? But both of them have been rewarded up to this point. One of them so successful, they could buy another company. The other one so successful, they could sell the company for doing what they've done. Yeah. And so we have to go in and say, okay, it's a new game. It's over. It starts over now. And everything you've done up till now, it that's that's automatic and feels right to you and drives you every day is, I don't say it's wrong, but it may not fit now. So you guys would be good working with innovation industries, companies that require that kind of a mindset where if you want to keep growing and evolving, you've got to always be thinking a step ahead. Yes. It, whenever there's a situation of what got you here won't get you there, mm. it can be something that is, or, you know, is old and stodgy that needs to break open or something that just, you know, an industry that's changing or a company that's growing a lot and like, wow, things are different than they used to be. How do we wrestle with that? How do you, and I think of this, whenever I talk to somebody, my marketing hat is always on the back of my head, like thinking, how do you find them? Because it's not like you can go do a LinkedIn filter for, well, I guess there is growth metrics and things that are not very reliable, but <clears throat> yeah. How do you, how do they get to you? Well, right now it's a lot of word of mouth. I mean, mm -hmm. this is one of the benefits of, you know, Anna and I both having spent 20 years in EO, we love, know a lot of business owners. Yeah. Um, and then Anna is a global facilitator and trainer for EO and YPO. So she talks to a lot of people as well in that role. And so we just, we happen to know a lot of people. Um, and then the next thing that happens is once it starts working, it spreads virally word of mouth. Uh, okay. So this is a, this is an old school word of mouth business, right? So within yeah. someone I, in the old days, it, my in my staffing days, we called mushrooming mushrooming the business. Like finance connects you to operations, connects you to R and D. Is it that kind of an approach? Uh, yeah, it's actually more. Company A has breaks through breakthroughs and to connect us to Company B. Okay. You know, yeah. it's sort of CEO to CEO. Typically, it's the CEO that's bringing us in because they've got, for example, a great team and we just aren't getting it done. What? Or these people just fight all the time or I can't. And so they bring us in to solve that. And then they talk about, wow, lightning difference, right? To another CEO. And they're like, oh, what did they do? So that's right. really how it goes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was looking at your blog, your website earlier, and there was a blog post that I stopped. I thought, that's really interesting. So first of all, I noticed on your site that the blogs are written by, you call them Polaris Institute members. I would think of that tradition as a client, right? So Yeah, like correct. Clients, yes. Okay? Yeah. And it says, uh, these are team transformation stories from our members published anonymously to allow the members to share openly and honestly. This story is from Kelvin M. Why did you make that an important distinction, the anonymous aspect? Yeah, I think uh, maybe that's a choice we've made more than you know, they requested, we just wanted to make sure that they can share candidly about what their, their issue was. And frequently we find some, some real vulnerability in that company that they didn't know was there. I mean, you know, they think come in and fix this team, right? Well, when we go in and we start working, we find there are a lot of emotional things. I'll, I'll give you one great example. We, mm -hmm. we did a, a, just a values, uh, some values work with the company and um, we all have values, right? They're on the wall. And 
I, I was with the management team and we were talking about values and this would be a great case study. Great. We've helped you refine your values. But as we went around the values and explored them and they had one on the wall, which was um, oh, customer. Um, we do. Oh, what's the word? Sorry. I just the word that is the important word in the in the value. Um, let me come back to it because it's a word that also means uh, taking care of someone. Nurture. Um, nurture, like think of someone that's uh, has long term health issue, for example, that you're taking care of. Um, what's oh, the word? Comorbidity is like a couple of diseases. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you can edit this, but let me let me pull it up because I can get the sure, word. Sure. Um, off the website. Uh, oh, sorry, one second. There it is. There you go. Okay, got it. Yeah. So it was so simple. That's why I forgot it. <laughs> One of their values is we care for our customers. Okay. okay. Well, uh, duh. What's wrong with that? Right. As we went around the room though, we explored that idea that we all have our own bias, our own brain has experienced what it's experienced in life. They suddenly started to realize this was gonna be much deeper than they understood because they, they, they thought it was gonna be because what we care for our customers meant around the table was different for every person. Oh. Some of them, we do whatever it takes, we stay up all night. Some of them are like, we think about them and we reach out to them or we, we anticipate their problems before they happen. And one of the people on the management team had been quiet and we got around to her and we'd created enough of a safe space. She said, caring is a burden. Hmm. We're like, whoa. Wow. And her history of caring was somebody she had had to care for as her in her young life when she was a, you know, a child, you know, like a teenager, she yeah. had a very sick parent. And part of her life experience was that caring for someone while you do it and you love them it's a lot of work and a lot of emotional burden right and so a simple word like care what does that even mean and when we throw something out like that do we know what everyone in the room is thinking and so a lot of times we get into into a process like that and things come out we're like well okay we're not going to put your name on the website for that because that's we want to share that vulnerability that came out in the room and that's when teams really can open up and say oh gosh as a group we need to make sure we understand what care for customers means mm -hmm. and as a team we can decide that now we can create behaviors of what we mean by that and not just assume because we put it on the wall everyone knows yeah and now we can work together on that and we can even know that we're part of what we're going to do is support this person in what they've been through in life as a team, by right? helping make sure they don't feel that pain that they mm -hmm. that came with them that we didn't even know was there again because wow. they have their bias, we have our bias, right? Yeah. So that's an example of the kind of work that happens in the room that really opens things up. I love that. There's so many things that I'm going to probe into a little more. One is you couldn't that that doesn't come out in the first ten minutes of sitting down at the <laughs> right. So like, how no. did you get to that point? What do you yeah, want well, to get to that point of vulnerability and them, them being comfortable sharing that? Right. Well, it's a matter of setting the stage so that, that, again, a lot of it goes back to that brain science base that we have. The brain science base, again, sort of depersonalizes it and makes everyone in the room realize that they, what they're experiencing, what they're feeling is just the sum total of what they've had in their life. So it's okay. And creating that environment is the first step. And then, of course, some people are you know, braver than others and starting to share. She was the last one to share. <laughs> but starting to create that and show even that everyone has a different perspective. Um, and, and by the way, we were going around the table and one person said, you know, we work all night if we have to. Other people in the room were nervous about that. That's not what I think caring is, right? I think caring is making sure we don't have to work. We had another one um, for a, a company that had like, a really specific safety issue that they were working on. And one of the people at the table thought that hard work meant you stay after hours. If you got to stay till eight o'clock at night to get it done, you stay after eight to get it done, till eight to get it done. And someone else at the table, when we created this open space to say, well, let's just talk about all the different possible perspectives there could be at this table about what doing it right means. Yeah. One of the other people said, I, I think if we have to stay till eight o'clock, we're going to make a mistake and someone's going to die. Oh, wow. Interesting. I, we, if, if we are tired, so someone thought being tired meant you were doing it. Someone thought being tired means we're not doing it. I'm like, oh my goodness. Wow. Okay. You're both right. 
Right. But you both, but we got to choose a path here going forward. So that stuff comes out around the table amazingly when you start letting everyone open up and say, well, this is what I see when you say just that word. Do you guys encourage, do something to encourage the leadership team or whoever brought you and engaged you to share first? Because I think it's going to be hard for somebody in a lower level to be first out of the gate saying, you know, caring is hard. Yeah, yeah, you've got to read the room. And if it's uh, if it's people from you know um, different levels in the organization, certainly trying to get the leaders to go first and and exhibit that behavior is key. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Another thing I find values. I'm very interested by companies' values, how they how they are formed, how often they come from the owner and founder. But the owner, you've got to, just leaving them there doesn't do much good. Like you've got to yeah. get the rest of the team to really be behind it. And I, the analogy that I remember, I read it somewhere in a book, which is, have you ever heard of a company that says, we don't care about our customers, right? right. <laughs> we, we don't care about quality. We don't care. So it's very trite to say, well, why are you guys, what makes you special and unique? Well, Bill really cares about his customers. Well, I, for God's sake, I would hope so. Right, exactly. So getting these values to have actual resonance, you guys do a lot of work in that area too, or as part of the, the approach? Yes, uh, because you have to make it real and and make it clear, right? So- there's another one great when people have like do the right thing. What is that? <laughs> right. No one's doing the wrong thing, or That's are right. they? Right. So, yeah. so it becomes, um, you know, behaviorally. What does that even look like? How do we know for doing it? So, um, mm-hmm. translate it into behaviors, and and this is where then it feeds into things like a strategic plan or performance metrics. You know, we're doing uh, mental health and mental performance coaching, but we're not working typically with the HR department. We're working with the operations and and business operations side of things because we're moving metrics Hmm. and that's really where this has values to say okay how do we get efficient and effective and we know what page everyone's on here that is interesting so you sit down with them at the beginning do you set okay at the end of this engagement we'll have achieved x y and z what kind of metrics would those be engagement's hard to measure for instance but yeah but they they we always find that there is uh there's a an objective business problem, whether it's, okay. um, you know, in the case of um, of the company buying the other company, right? It's like the teams on time delivery, uh, working together, turnover of people leaving is a big one. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, we can definitely, in a long-term engagement, find out what those b- business metrics are we're going to move here because they're having some problem like that or they wouldn't feel like they need a solution. There's often a triggering event that leads into you, whether that's a merger, acquisition, a sale, or, hey, we just have a really high turnover. That would be a good uh, client to work with. There's some kind of stress that's breaking the system they've had up till now, right? Whether that's growth or acquisition or, you know, in some cases it's a pandemic. I mean, whatever it is that stre- that you you had things that worked and now they're not working anymore and it doesn't, why not? I mean, well, we can break that down and figure out why not and then rebuild it. There's another blog on your site, which I've seen you present on, and I'm going to I'm gonna kind of see if you can summarize it for us. Sure. It's, I am versus I feel. Changing one word can change your ability to process emotions. What is that? Yeah. So um, when we're working with individuals, um, and we do teamwork and individual work, but even sometimes the teamwork is with individuals on the team, right? We, can, we sometimes are coaching individuals and working with the team as well. Mm-hmm. And a big part of what people do is uh, ha- have emotional responses to things. Um, and, and this is in personal life as well as work, but somebody makes me mad or, you know, this is really, you know, whatever. And there's a syntax thing that we use when we're speaking, a semantic uh, way of saying it. We tend to say either two things, one, two things. You say, you're making me mad or you're making me X, whatever X is. You're mm-hmm. making me angry, making me sad. Or I am sad, right? Mm -hmm. Well, neither of those things are true from a logical standpoint. Like you don't have the force or mental telepathy. You can't actually make me mad. You Mm -hmm. can do something that I get mad about, right? Mm -hmm. But you can't make me mad. I make me mad because of what you're doing, because I feel like me getting mad will somehow stop you from doing it or I'll be able to whatever. So the, the emotional reaction is always my own reaction to you. Mm. You make me mad. You know? um, so just realizing no one is making you anything. You're making yourself that, okay? Is the first like, what? Okay. But then the next thing is, is that you tend, when, we're, when we have some um, discomfort physically, knee, headache, whatever, 
we say, my knee hurts. Mm. My head hurts. I have a headache. We never say, I am knee pain. <laughs> I am headache. But when we have emotional discomfort, we take that as our identity. I am angry. I am sad. I am in love. Wow. And why do we do that? When we do that, we're giving power to that emotion as though we have no power over it. Hmm. We, we're, we're, on a, we're on an anger, anger carnival ride until it ends. And then when it gets over, then maybe I can calm down. But I don't have any choice in the matter. Again, if you realize you're making yourself angry, you can make yourself, you know, it's, it's a lot of work, but you can make yourself not angry. And also you can just say, I ultimately, I feel anger right now. Okay, okay. Cameron, what you're doing is making, I'm feeling anger. I'm making myself feel anger making myself feel sad and then it's something that i can feel and experience what does that feel like versus just i am and i'm in it so there's kind of a perspective shift that we do that helps to break through a lot of these emotional things and you can imagine how that changes the team dynamic no one's making you mad mm -hmm. i'm i'm just doing things and you get mad about it but so that helps to again lower the barrier there, lower the bar to, to emotional challenges. And then we can start to rebuild and, and say, okay, I don't have to get mad about that. You're not, um, those and are then also, the way of, those are getting in the way of some kind of breakthrough, right? Yes. Or, because you feel like you have no choice. I'm angry. I, I, yeah, what can I do about yeah. that? I'm just well, angry. I just am. I just am. Right? right. And then until it runs its course, you, you feel like you can't do anything. And of course, no one can tell you to do anything. You're just, you're just on the sideline for a while. Or everyone's going to deal with what you're what you're going to work through. Everyone in the room is going to have to live through your cycle of that until you get done with it. I think of uh, like a two year old having a temper tantrum it affects the whole yes. family, the the household, the environment, and a lot of these things that you're talking us through, bringing back to that time when my kids were younger and trying to get them to identify the emotion that they have and how can we get past that. Yeah, uh, it's, it sounds very basic, but it's 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 essential. Yes. And it's essential if you, if you want to be a cohesive team as adults, <laughs> okay. a lot of us bring that it, it was, it was successful as a behavior, right? Mm. I get angry. People run from me and I can get what I want, or they give me what to, to shut me up. And so it can be reinforced to the point where you just, you can drive everyone around you crazy to get what you want. And they're just like, okay, fine. Well, uh, but it isn't a team thing. And also there, there's a reason they're doing it because it's work. They've seen in Correct. the past, when I throw a yeah. temper tantrum, I'm, I'm the boss, I come in and throw mm -hmm. my papers down. People react, they get up that there's activity. Yep. Yeah. So it's that what got you here won't get you there. There's a point at which that model breaks. And when you reach that point, we're ready to talk to you. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about brain science. What does that mean? So um, a lot has been discovered in the last uh, 10 years or so um, in the brain science field. Now, I'm not a brain scientist. We have people that are advising us to build a program. We're using brain science in our program, using discoveries in brain science to really set the table for how the discussion happens. Mm -hmm. But um, basically, um, this idea that our brain has only experienced what it's experienced in the past. There's been a lot of work in um, MRI technology by having people go through certain situations and track what's happening in their brain and see what's happening. There's 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 just a lot of new information about how our brains work um, and what they're trying to do and the fact that they're creating a, our own reality, right? Our brain has, when we go through the, the, the course, we teach people, your brain has only one job. You only have one for one reason, and that is to keep you alive long enough to carry on the species. Your brain's job is not to make you happy, find your purpose, find joy. It isn't trying to do any of that. It's trying to keep you alive. You know, effectively, you are prey. We think we're the top of the food chain, but I'm hello. I'm round, slow, and soft. I got nothing. I have no weapons, no armor, no protection. But I didn't live in a house, you know, and have cars and everything to protect me. I'd be like vulnerable out there, quivering. Right. So our brain knows this. Our brain knows that really we're prey and everything is out to get us. Mm. And so it spends its whole life, its whole energy, all of its energy and focus on keeping us safe and protected. That's why we live in a house that's 72 degrees and we have cars around us and we don't want to go out in the weather. And how much time do we spend talking about the weather? Yeah. The weather isn't really a danger to you and I, except, well, but it could be, right? <laughs> so our brain's anticipating what to wear tomorrow. So our brain is running around trying to keep us safe from danger. Um, and it's a very dangerous world and our brain can find all the dangers out there we can imagine to try to keep us safe from. So it ke it's keeping us anxious and keyed up and stressed on purpose. Mm -hmm. So that understanding now, and they've been able to sort of prove that and show you that your brain is, I mean, we, 
not even just brain science, but even just science around things like your phone. Why are you addicted to your phone? You constantly need to check for threats and see what's going on, social media, all these things. So the understanding of how our brain works and what it's trying to do, and then the fact that we can rewire things, mm. that your brain has experienced what it's experienced up till now. And if you experience something new enough times, repeat it over and over again, you can change your expectation. Uh, for me, a big one was traffic. Traffic yeah. used to be constantly irritating me. So many people in traffic needed lessons from me. Yeah. And I've been able to rewire that. I realized, okay, they're clueless. They don't know what's going on. They don't really are worried about me. So I'm not going to worry about them. And it takes practice over time, but I can rewire that to where it's like, I don't, traffic doesn't bother me anymore. Wow. I actually, and it feels to me, one of the things I tell people is that it's not that I, uh, I'm, I'm all Zen, uh, traffic is bothering me. I've actually worked on it enough to the point where I think people learned how to drive better. Mm, okay. That's my reality now is that you know, people aren't driving so bad. Used to be, they were driving terribly when in fact they haven't changed, but I've changed. So right. now we understand that you can rewire memory by practicing new things. You can rewire emotional memory just like you can rewire physical memory, just like you can learn to play the drums or the piano, you can learn to find more joy in life by practicing various wow. things. So it's like yeah. training anything else, going to the gym. No different. Training. There is no, Amazing. one of the other blogs on our on our website talks about, there's no such thing as muscle memory. Hmm. We think of muscle memory as learning to deck a card, shuffle deck a card. There's no such thing as muscle memory. There's just memory. Hmm. Your brain knows how to do things. Some of which move your muscles, some of them which, you know, get, get you angry. Your brain just, has a whole set of files it runs and some of them are useful for you now and some of them are not they maybe were useful when they were installed but they're not useful anymore change them yeah rewire that there's a book that you put me on to which i'm listening to now atomic habits mm, yeah right and it talks yeah. a lot about this stuff and just uh i think we overcomplicate things a lot but like if yes. you want to make change put yourself in an environment where change can happen so yes. i want to lose 10 pounds don't bring candy, pizza, and junk food to the house. It's harder when you have children because I can't say, hey, you guys are, are out of shape. You should need all that stuff. That's harder. Yeah. But you want to start going to the gym, just sign up for gym and go every day. Eventually, you'll be working out there because you're there. Yes. Yeah. James Clear is one of our heroes of Polaris Institute. It's, it is the way, his process is the way you change things. Now, we're able to go in and break things down and show people they need to change and show them new perspectives. But then as far as building those new habits so that you react that way when you walk in the door at home or you don't react that way when your coworker walks in with a whatever, that's practice. And James Clear's model is what we use a lot. Maybe I'll come in for the uh, traffic uh, management, <laughs> uh, anger management uh, modules. And a break off one that we could we could do. Yeah, we'll just have a special <laughs> special class. For I, I, I moved to different places. I deliberately moved to places where my commute is less or you no know, no commute just to get around it. <laughs> right. Um, well, I'm gonna well, I'll tell you. Let me tell you the secret. One of the yeah. things you can try as a mental trick. Yeah. Think of what you're imagining that other driver looks like. And for me, it was always like there's some young 20 year old jerk right and now what i do is i imagine everyone else on the road is a little grandmother okay and so now when they do something stupid oh they're sweet they don't even know god pat them on yeah. the head i yeah. just feel differently about who's in the other car and it changes my whole perspective of what they're doing they don't have you know they don't have malicious intent in mind they don't try to cut me off and keep me from my thing they're like oh my god they're clueless i right. need to help them across the traffic here watch That's out they're coming thing. over I like to think if I could read their mind or be in their car and hear what they're what they're they're saying, or the other one is flip it around. Like I got turned around and I'm trying to do a, a three point turn in the middle of a street where I shouldn't. And yes. I want them to know, hey, sorry, my bad. Give me a give yes, me a right. Oh, so right? you want to have like, I'm sorry, what the hand signals are. <laughs> yeah, I like to think of that when we get stressed at home, like we're preparing for people to come visit for Christmas or a kid's birthday party. We we, we gotta do these different things and the stress mounts up. And I step back and think. This is all for a seven-year-old's birthday party. Let's keep that in perspective here while we're doing this, right? They're not going to care if we don't have yeah. the pinata in time or whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. So uh, before I'm going to ask you one last question. Before I yeah. want to that, I'm going to let people go to your website. That is sure. polarisinstitute.net. And you can read more of Bill's. The blog posts are great. And Thanks. the content they have there is good. Bill is regularly... Um, speaking and and putting content out so encouraged to follow his linkedin page there uh i see all this culminating in, into a book in 10 years mm, so yeah. my question is what, what's that book going to be called and what's the uh what's the the hook or the angle that going to be 
Oh, wow. Um, I don't know, but what it really is, the book is probably just going to be the process. Um, you know, like a lot of people want to dig into the whole process. I want to understand the whole step. We have a whole uh, Polaris process model with three different components. We have performance pro uh, components. We have practice components and, and premises, which are the science parts of it. And some people want to really dig into that on their own. Mm -hmm. And so the book will probably be just, you know, a textbook sort of thing that supports the program. Tying it all together. Yeah. Almost like a, well, not a, maybe not a handbook because a handbook, you can kind of jump in and out of different sections, but like a, almost like a manual maybe. Right, right. So that, that that would be useful for us. Right now we're going in and working on a specific thing with a with a company or a, or a team or whatever. We could say, grab the book, flip to, flip to chapter six, okay. um, instead of just bring, to bring it in that thing. So that's probably what we'll do is sort of have a more you know, overarching textbook there. Could this be taught in an MBA program someday? Should it be? Um, yeah, I think, um, yes, I think this is kind of where leadership is going to go. I think we're finding that we're going to have to be much more empathetic, much more, much more about EQ than IQ. And I think this is the kind of work a lot of people are going to do to realize, well, my, my team is limited by IQ. We've got to find out what EQ looks like and what, what does that look like? What does training like that look like? And uh, mm -hmm. how do we do it? So I think it's going to become more of a thing. You and I have talked about the gap in the game book and concept. Mm -hmm. That one comes to mind when I think of that. If you go back 10 years ago, the concept of looking at EQ and measuring it and 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 how it's changed has changed dramatically over that time frame. Mm -hmm. So it's good to look back and see where where, where we come from 10, 15 years ago with respect to uh, EQ. And I think even, you know, there's been a, a, a big push in the last few years around DE and I in companies, especially, mm -hmm. you know, it seems like it happened during COVID, but um, also that becoming something that is not something to just remedy the past, but also something to rally for the future. Like, wow, let's make this a superpower, not just, you know, a, a repair of what's happened. Let's figure out how we can really utilize this. And teams that do that will excel. Wow. Well, I'd love to have you back in the future to uh, pull that apart a little bit. I think that when people push back on that to me, the examples I give are, have you heard of the movies ba uh, Black Panther and Barbie? Why were mm. those billion dollar global successes? And, and and people say, well, I think DEI is overblown or it's a fad. I, I disagree. Yeah, I think it, uh, again, we think it's only some, you know, because we're back to that thing where bias is a negative thing and that we need to fix the biased people. Wait, we're all biased. Yeah. Oh, okay. And bias, since it's not just a negative we're trying to eliminate, it could be a positive to capitalize on. That's when it lights up and that's when it becomes something that's really good. Because mm -hmm. you're bringing yeah. conversations out in the open rather than oh my God, I should yeah. feel ashamed that I don't know X. Right. I want to I want to have as much diversity around this table. I need as many. If you just think of just innovation, I need as many realities and points of view around this table as I can get mm -hmm. in order to succeed. Yeah. Now it's something I want. I, I we've got to have it. That's right. It's not. It's a com yeah. It's a competitive advantage. And, and oh, yeah, by no the way. Question. My clients are like that too. My clients are also diverse. They're not homogenous, all the same cut, cookie cutter either. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, Bill, so much for that. Thank I think you. We talked forever. Um, uh, that was Bill Troy, uh, founder and co-owner of Polaris Institute. This has been America Open for Business. And I'm Cameron Heffernan. Thanks for listening today. And uh, we look forward to the next episode and catch you next time. Bye. Thanks for listening to the America Open for Business podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.